I think the vet bro is a stereotype, not an archetype. And that's one thing I think where when it comes to academia, vice, um, you know, the more non-traditional route in, into storytelling is, man, you go into a fucking master's program with storytelling, nobody's accusing you of being a vet bro capitalizing off of your service, you know? So within any of y'all's uh, storytelling and character building, uh, the easiest reference would be Joseph Campbell, but you guys each have followed these archetypes personally, but also when you're creating your own characters within the military and fiction. Um, and the easiest reference within this certain circ circumstance is Lucky Joe and how you guys created characters that you guys uh, found within your military career of guys in your platoon, because every platoon had these, these certain people. So. Let's talk a little bit about these, these archetypes within military and within fiction or, or uh, literature in, in general or within people in general. All right, I'll, I'll try to, I'll parse through it first. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about archetypes in the military and you're talking about archetypes in literature, it's two completely different things. So archetypes in the military are these, you know, reoccurring personalities, which Leo and I um, and Brian Kimber, who's not here, we, we wanted to kind of touch on. In, in our in our novella and so um i remember years ago 2009 i had gotten on uh voluntary reserve orders just to kind of just get back into the marine corps a little bit and i was with a third force recon company out of alabama just for a little while i just did a few drills and we were at a shooting package and i remember these guys talking you know you're talking about like you know you're at the uh, checkout line and you're listening to people speak and then you might be you know you're like oh well, that's like a kind of dialogue exercise but i was just listening to how people just what people talk about in general and this is this is a a profound memory I have is these two guys were talking and they were like in every platoon you have like like the porn addict degenerate you have the super religious guy who has no tattoos and doesn't chew tobacco but will like kill someone in a heartbeat and then you have like you know the guy that you know is going to do 30 years and then you have you know and, and and they just rattled off this like merry-go-round of people and I was like yes 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 you know and I was like and like these these people aren't you know they're not trained by the by DOD to like you know like like uh 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 catalog military personalities they just naturally did and to this day i remember that and that that was one of the things that inspired uh uh lucky joe and so leo and i um and i'm, I'm very proud of joe of the character joe watts because i really think collectively we created somebody that kind of really jumps off the page and it's that um it, it is one of it is definitely one of the military archetypes I mean, maybe leo can uh, it was jump on it. i think yeah. it was a little intuitive <laughs> You know, because we've experienced that, like in where uh, an archetype becomes a stereotype, right? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the learned guy who could fuck it. I don't even know what an archetype is, right? Like, uh, I know what a stereotype is, and I know that in in you know in every company and every platoon we had them. Uh, to uh, to Dave's point, like, um, and we lived that experience and you you draw from it and and you know it's yeah the capturing of reality i guess i don't know um and and those those people who in uh in the in the freeze frame this tiny little speck of a moment that is our human life our hundred years that we have here we grasp a hold of this thing that um a lot of writers throughout the, all of the history of writing have done and uh, we categorize those personalities this way or that way because that's how our brains work. We categorize things, and uh, yeah, and we it, we simplify uh, personalities uh, because simplifying things is um, easy for us. All the things that we have going on, and, uh, and then we write that character. You know, it's 
take the magic out of it completely and utterly. You know, you do, you have, and, and like, I wasn't in a recon platoon in the Marines. I was in Ranger Battalion, but it definitely had the porn addict and the guy who was completely religious with no tattoos who would shoot a motherfucker in the face in an instant. And uh, we had all kind of the same guys across the board. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not, I'm not uh, smart enough or educated enough to be able to put them into archetypes, but I could definitely slam them into stereotypes. And uh, same thing, right? I'll write the fuck out of a stereotype yeah. uh, because it, it resonates and it works. Well, I think that, you know, we've talked about archetypes, like the soldier is an archetype, right? Like Captain America is the soldier of the Avengers. Um, and so within that archetype, though, there's a lot of subtlety and there's a lot of nuance. Or like, as you're saying these different like types, I'm thinking of like people from my team who I wouldn't have described as being overtly or explicitly like religious but of everybody in the team they were the most religious right um whereas like I, for sure one guy on my team was mormon we always made fun of him because he was a terrible mormon he didn't play by any of the rules he's drinking always had caffeine a lot of <laughs> a lot of things or you know the porn addict on the team was really just the guy who didn't turn his speakers off that one time <laughs> so all we all takes. know <laughs> one mistake that's the guy yeah. um so like i think the way those like identities get built is relational right because there's no coincidence that every unit has these people it's not like the military looked at everyone's records and was like well b company doesn't have a porn addict so <laughs> i guess that's where we're sending this guy um i think it's you know we we derive those those opinions or those understandings of each other in sort of like relation to everybody, which really means that we all have those tendencies. Some people just exhibited them more openly or more. Or got caught in them. Yeah. 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 Somebody and then play the role afterwards, <laughs> right? right? Like, all right, fuck it, I'll own it. You yeah, know? exactly. Because it's always better to, in that environment. It's always better to own it than to shy away from mm -hmm. it. Because as soon as you shy away from it, it will, it, they will beat you with it. <laughs> right. I think the difference between an archetype and uh, and a stereotype is a stereotype typically denigrates somebody down to their most basic or uh, it, it, it's something that is like you're almost looking down upon them from and it's usually something that you'd use to describe lazy writing whereas an archetype is indicative of a complex character that uh, a lot of thought is put into and uh, people don't typically refer to archetypes as um, something that is either lazy writing like if you use the model of you know one of joseph campbell's or one of the other examples of like the different archetypes out there uh you know they're not going to say oh that's lazy writing or you know or, or you hey you're reducing that character to this archetype whereas with stereotypes it's usually hey you didn't put enough thought into this that's lazy writing and you're you know reducing somebody to their religion or their skin color or their you know, something that's really not their true character, you know, because um, it's like, you know, the archetypes, whether it's like, you know, the magician or the hero or, you know, the different examples that's out there, those archetypes can be Muslim, they can be Christian, they can be Buddhist, they can be white, they can be black, they can be Asian, they can be gay, straight, trans, like there's, they're not any, where the stereotypes tend to be like, oh, the dumb blonde or the, you know, the the terrorist Muslim or the, you know, um, so I think that's like the big difference between an archetype and a stereotype. That all being said, I think that in writing, it's kind of, they're both kind of tools to have in your back pocket, right? Like sometimes I think it is kind of useful to be able to know and be aware of the different stereotypes that are out there and have the ability to play off of those um, I think there's a lot of I just I think there's a lot of room for creativity there, and then just you know archetypes that that again I think it falls into the the rules argument right of where like hey your character doesn't have to fit neatly into this archetype box right yeah um, but if you know that they're out there that maybe those are some guideposts for you as far as when you're doing character development of things to think about or or the path that they take or that informs the decisions that they make um, you know. I think it's kind of fun to identify the people in your own life that are fit certain archetypes, you know, and or like, you know, where do I fall? Or have you, you know? have you read much Young? What's that? Young, like, is it kind of one of the 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 
bricklayers of archetypes, right? Uh, Carl Jung. I haven't. No. No. Yeah, yeah. Like well, you talked about like the magician and like the soldier. He's like the wise old man. Yeah. 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 I just curious. Yeah. Like where the where the information comes from of the concept of the archetype, right? And uh, like he was one in in psychology that definitely like he was. Um, Paramount in, in in creating those blocks of you know and and uh, I don't say labeling but defining mm-hmm. right here are these sections of people and how they kind of fit into those things just kind of curious and, and nothing else you know how it, I think how it particularly ties into like this group the audience that may be watching this I think the vet bro is a stereotype <laughs> not an archetype. And that's one thing I think where when it comes to academia, vice, um, you know, the more non-traditional route into in storytelling is, man, you go into a fucking master's program with storytelling, nobody's accusing you of being a vet bro capitalizing <laughs> off of your service, you know? <laughs> Whereas if you do it the Leo or the Marty route, it's like, oh, what, what the fuck, guys? Move on from your military service. Why can't you just, <laughs> you know, go be an insurance salesman or something, you know? Um, I think that there is some interesting stuff there. Uh, That's a very interesting point. In fact, we had a question for tomorrow that, ha- uh, that when you asked for the, Q- the Q&A prompts for tomorrow's yeah. podcast, is one of, the, one of the questions was something along the lines of... We'll d- dive into it a little bit. Oh, just one, somebody wrote, uh, you know, like, do you think it's healthy to constantly... His, his wording was t- paraphrasing, like, you know, constantly obsessed about war. Don't you think it's time to move on? Yeah, when is it time to move on, yeah, right? Yeah. So if we're talking about people who write about war... Um, we all have. We all have. Everyone, yeah. everyone here has written about war. At what point is it healthy uh, to not anymore? Right? Why like, would you avoid one of the most dramatic events of your personal experience? Like, again, like going back to the mechanic thing. It's like, oh, you know, I know I've got a fucking ratchet over there, but I'm not going to use it, even though it's the right tool <laughs> or the or the right like. Get the fuck out of here. I know I was here. on the pit crew at the Indy 500, uh, and but like yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lean on that experience when I'm fixing yeah. this fucking. And particularly Jewish. if you're a writer, that's the only thing you've done as an adult is be in the military and go to war, and you haven't had any of these other life experiences like maybe marriage or having kids or any of the other fucking nine million things one can experience in life. If your only real experience in life is like, hey, I joined the military and went to war. Well, you write what you know. You write what you know. You like write until you know. something else comes along, which is like Leo. Your first book was about war. Your second book was about traveling. Uh, <laughs> you know, like well, and that's the that that's, was your second and, one, and right? maybe the third, but uh, the second, second one was, was about, about coming, uh, coming back from war. Yeah, I got those two mixed around. That's yeah. right. You write actually, but it's okay because you wrote, actually wrote the forward for that second one, so I'm not mad. At, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember it. So it was war, transition, then <laughs> travel. Probably yeah. read it. Well, it's a good chronological <laughs> order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and 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 uh, and there you might know, be an archetype or two in there to, too. Uh, I don't know. Read, I mean, the guy might have meant it uh, differently, but I it potentially when that, you when you move past it. What's when? When is it? I th- that's how I read it. Like yeah. when? When is it appropriate to move past that subject matter? Yeah, maybe. And, and I know? think potentially it's you learn more about the questioner than anything else. Is that they might believe that by merely writing about war, you're somehow fixated on it. Not necessarily true. It's just. It's just. It, it was just. It's just informing. It's informing your art. You know. It doesn't mean you're you're tortured by it. Or yeah. No, no. I. I. This yeah. is the way that I take it. Is like. <laughs> War for us, we did it in our, for the most part, in our 20s, right? That was a chapter, right? And our characters, each one of them individually, went through that chapter. And they went through a lot uh, in that. There was a lot of lessons that that character learned. And we're still continuing on through our arcs. Uh, we, are, we are getting on, we're halfway through our particular stories. And our character is still very much influenced by the things that they experienced in those earlier chapters. And they should be, because if they're not, then we're disingenuous. Um, That's a good point. That, yeah, that yeah. everything uh, from uh, to the end of our story should be in some, way, uh, in some way influenced by those earlier chapters. Because if we just completely and utterly negate them, then uh, our, our stories, uh, it's just not authentic. 
Um, and to take those moments, and this is just the way I look at it personally, to take the best things of that and the worst things and to allow them to influence our lives in a degree. To, and like when I'm talking about like our lives outside of just writing, to be able to be, step back a second, to take those, to take those experiences that we had in our earlier chapters and to allow them to develop our character and to be in the best version of ourselves, but then to take the best and the worst of those things and allow that to influence our writing because we understand, we understand the, the scope of human capacity for both positive and negative. We can see how bad human beings can be and we have in those earlier, in those earlier moments in our life and to understand that to when we write anything that we have that range and to to utilize it as a tool as as any tool um and to understand where humans can go in their darkest and in in the moment where they're willing to throw themselves on uh you know a you know and at least in my military experience the the really heavy set girl in the bar in order that their friend gets with uh the uh very good looking uh, woman in the bar or grenade or whatever other thing that you would do altruistically for your friend um, the point being is that, that 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 earlier chapter is incredibly necessary for the development of your arc through your entire story. And you cannot forget it. You cannot just throw it away, whether you're writing about the military or not, whether you're writing about hobbits and, uh, you know, um, it's going to influence you and it should. You should utilize that because it's an experience. War is an experience that um luckily the minority the sliver of our population experiences and we have that we have that extreme experience and we should lean on it uh, that's one of the only better. truly timeless things that we do somebody that wrote about war 600 years ago we can identify with it today same thing with our experiences 600 years from the fucking building somebody who wrote a book about the dude who built the pyramids like i can't really identify with that you know like the blacksmith in the in the dark ages can't really going into battle though those emotions are the same as they are for us today. To your point, Stephen Pressfield in Gates of Fire writing about uh, the uh, the other guys marching up and through the mud and the the like just the moment of it, like everybody going toward yep. battle and the hardship of it, but like the kind of the joy of it and the, the understanding of it. It was like I literally I was transported back to my time in range of battalion yep. you know and like it's it's a moment yeah that you connect the experience with experience of the soldier is uh, timeless it's timeless yeah uh, and i would i guess i'll try to um just say one last thing is i think the, the you question, will not say one the, last the no thing. but i'll say th this isn't I'll last i'll say, no, no. say i got a couple <laughs> things to say, no, 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 say on this on this on this no there's more to say uh, i'll okay. hijack you no, no 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 it's just um all right so we're talking about this this question that was that was sort of uh, prompt for, for tomorrow. And then one one thing that he either doesn't know or he forgot is that as he had pointed out earlier, is you have a book that's entirely about travel, and I have books that are entirely entirely about second you know uh, other world fiction. You know, so all we're really doing is revisiting war. You're right? No, it's it's we're not we're not you know uh, orbiting it eternally. It's just it's just, it just informs our artistic decision. You know, it's like one of the uh, um, a writer I'd heard about for many years, but I'd only recently started reading is Ambrose Bierce. He's just like Civil War badass mm -hmm. um, who influenced people like H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, he, he he's really on the high end of the umbilical cord of going down like uh, American fantasy. Is it he was um, he he split almost half like writing like horror and then writing just like war. So he would go back and forth as he saw fit, which is you know kind of what we're, what we're kind of what you could say we're kind of doing it's just right now we've revisited the war theme so it's not that we're um you yeah. know it's not that our well you know like like it's not like you know we're not we're one, it's not like a one trick pony type thing it's just it's yeah. just it's just something that uh we're not married we to it it's, to the, yeah. it's the girlfriend that we kind of go back to and fuck everyone so, <laughs> well, so that's that's what i want to go to i'm not saying your name but you know who you are <laughs> so the first thing is I love how you say I'm a virgin. Uh, <laughs> being a wingman for the fat girl is altruistic. I love that. <laughs> Secondly, or the grenade. Yeah, or that. the grenade. Uh, um, you're talking about it's almost somewhat becoming your identity in some sense, but like 
we fortunately like with with this this group and the, the other groups that we've, we've been a part of i was able to watch this documentary about tim o'brien and see this war and peace of him and this is a 60 70 year old man who with his kids like his last book is a, a, a pretty much like a send-off letter to his kids in some sense and all he can think about is the lessons he le learned during war and the struggle of putting man himself into war and, and the stakes of that as a 70 year old man who like talking about earlier like that's one of my grandparents at this point but like he experienced war back in Vietnam. And same with like Carl Mar Marlantis. It's like these men, it, it becomes such a huge part of you that every other aspect of your life is comparable to that moment, whether whether you like it or not. And it doesn't have to, it influences it almost no matter what. It doesn't have to be a part of it, but it, it definitely influences it. And uh, the, the, there, there is no, not, not necessarily no escaping it, but it, it is a part of you and it, it is a part of your writing it is a part of uh your interactions with other people whether whether you like it or not and it's not something you should just like submit to and accept by any means but like kind of like say yeah th this is me and this is what i've experienced and i'm proud of it but it's not what defines me necessarily too i think it depends on how much life you lived before or after war too yeah i think the goal is probably to try to just make it a chapter not the book yeah. Yes. Yeah. There are a yeah. lot of people. Well I think put. They make it the Sta book statement and, of the night, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I think that, especially now that I've got close to, I, I I think I'm almost at the point where I've been out of the military as long as I was in it. Um, you know, and you throw in the experience of like having kids, or, you know, for me it was like, man you know, talk about something that like informs my writing and stuff like watching my dad disintegrate and then bury him. Like that was as impactful mm -hmm. uh, to me as anything I experienced in war, you know? And so I think it's all about like, Hey, if war was the single singular, most traumatic, traumatic and or happy uh, experience of your life, then yeah, I can see where that kind of becomes your book and that's the thing that you always go back to or defines you. But I think if you continually kind of push the limits of your, you know, your personal human experience or, you know, whatever that means, depending on the person, right? Um, I think that's different for everybody. But, you know, the further you get away from the military, it's going to become less and less and less. And obviously that applies differently than the person that spent four to eight years in vice the person who spent 30 years in, you know, that's, it's a little bit different. It's, you know, you're likely at 30 years not to have as much time out as you did in, yeah. you know, it really is your book, you know, and Roger that, you know, that's the path you took in life. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, we're all kind of in that four to eight year territory, you know, so it's kind of like, okay, well, what fucking else did you do? Or did you just hang it up after you did your cool guy shit in the military? Yeah. You know, I mean, it kind of goes back again to into that, like, how deep is that well you have to draw from, you know, of life experiences? What's what's hard is it for that not to be it? Because I remember the defining moment of when, like, I did spend more time out of the military than I was in it. So, and, it and it happened relatively recently for me. And I was like, holy shit, like, why am I still pulling myself back to that? And it, it is a hard thing to escape at some point. And I've, I've just realized, like, it's not something I want to escape. It's something that is part of me. Yep. And... It is what it is, and I'll just keep moving forward. Uh, but yeah, it, it was just a chapter. But I find myself telling our nomadic veteran story more in casual conversation than I do any war story. Oh, absolutely! Well, yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Do you ever? And, like, it, and it's just as compelling as any good war story. Uh, yeah, you have all the elements of it. You have brotherhood, and you have purpose, uh, and you have a mission. You know. Uh, and it's all for a good and fuzzy thing, and it's not the end game of it. The winning and, result of it wasn't people dying, you know? And like war, it's something that the majority of the population has never experienced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, well, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it speaks to what, what a profound experience really is. I, two razor, razor thin examples is uh, uh, when Ozzy Osbourne was um, touring with Randy Rhodes, the guitar player that died in the plane crash, is that he, he says, he goes, the time that I was 
uh, with Randy Rhodes, like when they toured together, he seems that it was somehow it was a larger period of time than before and after. Uh, my ex-girlfriend, her grandfather, was um, a part of communist Czechoslovakia who for a while was able to go to, I think, Tunisia to do some sort of um, medical work. And he was there for like a year. And he's like pushing 90. And he still talks about it with this reverence, the way that a veteran would talk about it. And, and it, you know, what do those two things have in common? Is that it was for both the, Ozzy and the, and the Czech doctor, what they, what they have in common is this finite point in time. That it, was, it was just such a, a meaningful point in their lives that it kind of is sort of the uh, uh, centerpiece, you know, in some ways. It has, it has the most gravity that everything else orbits. And for a lot of vets, it's, it's that way as well. That speaks to the fact that time is not actually linear, and it is the observer who creates the universe. And if the observer's in interpretation of what is happening is slow or faster based on their flow state, uh, then so it is, right? This is about the point where we need somebody to take a piece of paper and fold it over on itself and poke a pencil through, just like in every space <laughs> event <movie> horizon. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to explain black holes or whatever the fuck yeah. nonlinear time. Yeah, I know exactly. You see the fucking yeah. gravity, <laughs> and oh. then the watch. Here's the fabric of time, and Marvel spin around. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. You guys don't like pull. LSD? You guys are not, no. <laughs> but there is something to the idea that when we talk about um, traumatic experience, and I think military experience, whether it's you know combat or basic training or whatever. It's you're in this uh, this period of time where you're being trained to think about death and not be concerned about it. So you go through this really this period of intensity, and when we talk about that narratively, the way we tell that story, that's it's not a linear track. There's not an end to it, as we're all discussing, right? It continues. Every story you tell after that is influenced by those experiences, whether it's about that experience or not. Um, so. That linear, that circularity really shapes the way we think about, or the way that time feels. So those moments feel big or they feel prominent because we keep returning to them. Even if your last deployment was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it feels recent. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Mm, yeah. That's a good way right? to put it. Yeah. So because when a character experiences trauma or goes through a, a traumatic narrative, they don't come out the other side with it behind them and they never think about it again, they return to it, right? Mm -hmm. The story is the process, not the, not the goal, not the end result. This may be getting way off track. Nope. That what you just were talking about made me think of something here. Um, as far as taking, we were talking earlier about life experience and how that informs your writing and stuff. Um, and how like your experiences in war don't necessarily have to go, only go into a war story and maybe this is getting into the tactics and not the overall kind of more strategic discussion that we're having here, but it's kind of like, you know, if you're writing about a brain surgeon, one of the things that I would, you know, the first time I ever saw human brains was like, I didn't kill the guy, but you know, somebody else did. And that was like, oh, those are what human brains look like. It wasn't this like deeply traumatic thing. I didn't have like, yeah. oh my God, you know, it wasn't anything like that. I imagine that like, if you were writing a story about a surgeon who went into his first real live tissue brain surgery, you could draw on that experience of like, oh, okay, so that is what a brain looks like. And you could apply those same emotions and thought processes and that inner monologue that you had in combat to a scene that you're writing about an ER physician or, you know, insert whatever. And 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 I think that's I think it's just a really good analogy for whether, you know, if it's the brain thing or any other thing out there where it's like you don't have to literally Take that see, that experience that you had, but you can draw on it yeah. to inform whatever story you are writing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was a little bit off topic of where we were at. No, 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 no. That's a it spoke to the nonlinear uh, aspect of this conversation in all time and it's all general. happening all at once. All at so. once, yeah, yeah. Like so, like uh, uh, to to uh, yeah, war writers uh, and the concept of non-linear time right uh um billy pilgrim got uh you know unstuck, uh, in, time. unstuck in time right uh kurt vonnegut slaughterhouse five uh and what he did uh with his personal experiences being um first a pow in world war ii and then um 
but in uh, you know the, the slaughterhouse five and 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 surviving the firebombing of Dresden, which is you know uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like the double the amount of human life lost is like. Hiroshima. Like yeah, it was, it was like, the Germany version of Hiroshima. Yeah, it was a fucking uh, yeah, pretty gnarly thing to live through, right? Um, and uh, so here, here we have this human being who um, who was in this war and uh, experienced this very big thing, and then allowed it to suggest his writing uh, for thirteen novels and uh, so many other pieces of writing. Um, and then, but what he did with that particular book, with Slaughterhouse Five, was he took that personal experience of war and then uh, laid it uh, simultaneously with the concept of n time is not linear and the trauma Fedorians and like all this other science fiction stuff and this interesting storyline. Did line. you say the trauma Fedoras? Trauma Fedorians, oh. I think, is the yeah. alien. Like, like so, like alien he had this whole science yeah. fiction yeah. thing going on Trauma simultaneously yeah. with his writing. Uh, right, uh, along with the story of Dresden and this bombing and th that really intense human experience that he had, yeah. and uh, it, I I don't know. To me, it was it was a very brilliant way to take this uh, very intense human experience um, and to be able to convey it to people, uh, and you get the intensity of that human experience that almost nobody, you know, anybody here even could really has had. Right. Oh, uh, maybe yeah. we could relate with in some way we could figure out a way we could tie it to this thing or that thing. But that's an exceptionally uh, intense human experience and then uh, create levity uh, with it. Right. It was a talk about a master writer of taking that uh, ex experience of war and um, and writing it out in a way that the general public could absorb what it was that he was conveying because he had these other topics that were there as well and they were uh kind of uh intersecting with one another throughout the course of it and um yeah like uh that's that um that's when it gets fun that's yeah. when it gets fun like, that is yeah. the fun part when right you can there. deliver when you can deliver yeah. a package that is uh, so like otherwise unreceivable unreadable uh, to a general population and 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 make it creative and go hey here and people laugh and they, you know, and you get James Franco to do the reading for your audio book, <laughs> which is the win of all wins. It's what yeah. I think we're all going for as writers is yeah. to get James Franco to read our words. Um, I'd and at least like Kervon to say no to him as the, uh, as the option. <laughs> Just <laughs> wants to decline Franco. Uh, a true artist. No thanks. No thanks, James. <laughs>